Good morning and officially a good welcome to the Assista Foundation's L Plus Earn Financial Literacy Program for Young Adults. This program has been specially engineered and curated for you. And so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here on time. For those who may not know me or for those who are meeting me for the first time, which should be very few of you, my name is Darren August. It has been my absolute pleasure being the host of this webinar for the last seven weeks. And today is, uh, today is week seven and next week we end off. But I've literally had the time of my life on this webinar series with every single one of you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's going to be a great one. Today's topic is entrepreneurship. Can you believe that? And it is no coincidence. <laughs> we actually are doing this webinar during Global Entrepreneurship Week. What? an amazing opportunity. And so you are so in the right place. Seven weeks in and it's only getting better and better and better. Just when we think we've really had the, the best webinar, every single week just seems to get better. And I know that today is gonna to be no different. Thank you so much for being here. I'm not alone. Obviously I've got the entire team in the background running this webinar with me. We've got Crystal monitoring the chat. We've got Clive supporting us from an IT perspective and the rest of the team who have sought far and wide to bring you the best guests. And today, as usual, we have some spectacular guests lined up. And so I'm gonna ask them to quickly switch on their cameras and say hello. First up, we have Musa Maluleka, who we had in week number one as well. And we've also got Owen Muzambi, who's joining us today. Owen, good morning. Good morning, Darren, how are you doing? I'm doing great. It's so great to have you on the webinar with us today. Awesome. Loving the I'm outfit. <laughs> Loving the outfit. <laughs> He's an expert. We're going to be hanging on his every word. And then Musa, we had, I think it was in week one. Musa, how are you doing? Good things. How are you doing, Darren? Good, man. Good to have you back with us for today's webinar. You can see Musa's in a car. I think he's literally had to run out of a seminar somewhere. But we'll catch up with you guys later. Thank you. You guys can go off camera. And we're going to catch up with you later on. So, guys, just a reminder one more time. The Moodle platform is still running. The Moodle platform is there to continue the discussion after the webinars. And I say this every week. All right. And so, register on the platform. Remember to go to www.alplusearn.co.za or .org.za and you'll be able to participate in quizzes. There's some forums there. There's amazing resources. And of course, we do um, give prizes every week as well for your participation on Moodle. And so um, the website, www.alplusearn.org.za, this is where there's all of the resources we touch on. Um, they are webinar recording. So you can go back and you can watch the sessions again. You can watch the sessions that you've missed and you can really just keep abreast with all of the information that we're sharing. I know sometimes it is a lot to take in in one hour and that's the reason why we have the platform and we have the website so that we can continue this experience beyond just this one hour that we have on a Saturday morning. And so without further delay, let me announce the winners for last week's participation. These are um, winners who were participating on Moodle and so you get a 300 Rand shopping voucher and first up, let's have some claps and snaps and congrats in the chat for Pindulo. So Pindulo, well done to you. You are the first recipient of a 300 Rand voucher. And second up, we have France. France Mashila, um, who is the second winner of a 300 Rand voucher. Remember guys, now that you've got 300 Rand that you weren't expecting, that means you can use 300 Rand and put it somewhere else that you would have used this week. All right, so just redirect your 300 Rand that you would have spent on groceries, redirect it to savings or investing or um, debt or anything that we've learned so far. All right, um, let's get into it. And so we are seven weeks in. Can you believe it? Today is week seven and we are talking entrepreneurship. And next week we end off with side hustle. And I can assure you, we're going to go out with a bang. All right. <laughs> and so let's get into today's content before I bring our guests on. And so guys, today we're talking about um, entrepreneurship. All right, exploring entrepreneurship. And so, um, as I mentioned, it is currently, it's Global Entrepreneurship Week. And so we are bringing you this content even in this week as well. But so when we think about entrepreneurship, we have to understand that entrepreneurs are driven by a mindset that seeks to find solutions for problems. So these are people who look around, see a problem, and then see that problem as an opportunity. All right. And so they're, they're, they're always asking questions like, what could I do about that? How can I turn that problem into an opportunity? And so entrepreneurs possess just 
a different skill. They just have um, certain skills and traits that can be developed by anybody who's interested. And so these are skills like independence and optimism because it's hard, okay? It's not an easy journey, but entrepreneurs, you'll see, they, they just keep going. They just believe they're going to make it. They just believe that the next thing is going to work and the next thing is going to be their breakthrough. Um, they are future focused. They are um, idea generating people. So they're always thinking of new ideas. They're persistent because as I mentioned earlier on, it's not always that the first idea works. And so you have to be persistent. Um, you have to be self-confident and believe in your product or your business or your solution. And of course, entrepreneurs just have a different level of passion, right? Not the, not the level of passion that some of us have, but a passion beyond, right? <laughs> and so that's what sustains an entrepreneur. And so once you have now discovered this opportunity or discovered this business idea, it's very important to develop a business model, all right? And so um, one of the key, the key points in the process um, of entrepreneurship is developing a business model. And so today we're going to consider some aspects of the business model canvas. Now, the business model canvas is a practical tool which was developed by Alexander Osterwalder and Ives Pignier to assist entrepreneurs develop their business ideas by considering the most important parts that make up a business. And so these people got together, these two people got together, and they've narrowed it down to nine important parts that make up a business. All right. Now, um, you can check out the website that's uh, that's on the screen right now, which is www.strategizer.com, and you'll be able to see all nine elements of the business model canvas. But for today, we're just going to be focusing on three parts. And so those three parts are your value proposition, your customer segmentation, and your revenue streams, all right? So please understand the business model canvas. It's a whole nine steps or nine parts, but we're just focusing on three today, all right? And I do know that this information will be available on the website as well. And so you'll be able to go through um, and um, find more details on the business model canvas. But note it down, write it down somewhere so that you can spend some more time going through, going through it in depth, especially if you're considering an entrepreneurial journey. All right, let's get into it. So the first one is the value proposition. And so this aspect gets you to think about what value are you delivering to the customer, as the name suggests, okay? And then, of course, which one of the customer's problems are you helping to solve? So that is your value proposition. What value am I delivering? What problem am I solving, okay? And so the, the key questions that you ask yourself here is who are you creating this value for? Right, and then some of the other aspects are how does the solution or the product um, overcome the existing problem, and how does this um, bring an innovative approach? All right, and so some examples of value pro proposition would be things like um, efficiency or efficacy. Maybe you can do something quicker than somebody else can do it, and so speed might be your value proposition. Maybe reliability. So maybe you see. Uh, you see an opportunity where everybody who deals with a certain organization is always complaining because they're unreliable. There is an opportunity for an entrepreneur to step in, offer reliability as the value proposition, and that becomes a business, all right? Or flexibility. Maybe some um, organizations are strict with their payment terms, but because you're able to offer a payment plan, flexibility now becomes your value proposition, all right? Aesthetic appeal. Maybe you just your business just looks better. Your business is just branded better. And so that becomes the value proposition. And of course, the last one um, is cost or affordability, right? You're probably able to offer it at a cheaper price or at a more affordable price. And so that becomes your value proposition. I hope you're, all underst you're, you're understanding it. I hope I've explained it clearly. If you have any questions on the value proposition, please pop it in the chat. And I'm sure that our guests will be able to answer it as well. Let's move on. Next up is customer segmentation, all right? And so even the best idea, you can have the best idea, but if nobody wants to buy it, if nobody wants to buy your product, you don't have a business, all right? And so it's very important that when you are developing your business, you have to consider who your customer is because your customer is the person who's going to be spending their money with you. They're going to be paying for your goods. They're going to be paying for your services. And so as an entrepreneur, you need to define who you will be solving a problem for, as I mentioned earlier on. And then you have to understand what are their wants, their needs, their desires, 
what is the environment that they function in or live in so that you're able to identify who your ideal customer is, all right? And so here, um, you, you might want to note this down, but if you're speaking to everybody, you're probably speaking to nobody. And so you want to be able to find your ideal customer as an entrepreneur. And so an example of, um, to, to maybe illustrate customer segmentation better would be somebody like McDonald's, for instance, right? They're one of the biggest restaurants in the world, serving a lot of customers. And so they're able to successfully serve all their customers because they, they've segmented their customers into groups with different needs and they address those needs with specific products. So for example, they've got kids as are their customers. And so they've got kiddies meals, they've got families. And so they serve big family meals. And then they've got working adults who serve, um, and so they serve grab on the go meals, all right? And so you can see that they've done well in terms of customer segmentation because they know who their customers are, they know what their customer wants and needs, and they know how their customers think. The next up is you need to consider revenue streams. And so this is about the income or the revenue that the business makes, right? And so for example, you may be able to generate revenue through a couple of ways, right? So selling or sales, um, then rental or leasing, advertising, subscription fees, usage fees. And so I wanna give you another example here. And so if we think about, um, so let me quickly tell you about seven different ways, all right? Of how you could create income streams in a business. So one would be selling of assets, all right? And then there is fees for usage, we have subscription fees, it's on the screen right now, renting or leasing, um, licensing to third parties, brokerage fees, or even advertising fees. And so if you think of, I don't know how many of you know, there's a, a very popular plumbing company in South Africa called Burgess, Pub, Burgess Plumbing, all right? And so Burgess Plumbing is one of the oldest and they're one of the biggest plumbing companies in the country. And so they don't only make their money through plumbing, all right? What they do is they've diversified their revenue streams and so, they have asset sales where the core business is sales um, with plumbing, plumbing materials, all right, or doing block drains or, or those kind of things or plumbing services, but they also lease and lend out some of the material. And so, for instance, when some of the equipment is not being used, they're able to rent it out. And so smaller plumbers are able to go and rent equipment from them, do little plumbing jobs. And so the company then has another revenue stream. And then another one is advertising revenue. And so they've also found revenue streams by utilizing space on their cars as advertising opportunities. And so I'm sure you would see the, the, some of the vehicles driving around and they are branded. And so they're, they're advertising um, other companies on their vehicles as well. And that is another form of generating income and creating another revenue stream in your business. And without any further delay, let me welcome our first guest. And so it's my absolute pleasure to welcome to the webinar this morning, Owen Muzambi. He is the founder and executive director of Driven Advisory PTY Limited, an innovation and development consultancy that designs and implements enterprise development interventions, supporting micro and small businesses across South Africa. He's also currently the country business development services advisor for the Seed Catalyzer and the Seed Starter or Replicator programs established by the United Nations Environment to support eco-inclusive businesses globally. Owen has experience managing a startup accelerator focused on developing entrepreneurial intent in youth in underserved urban townships within Johannesburg. He is an associate tutor for the Social Enterprise Academy, a Scotland-based organization accelerating the development of social um, enterprises in South Africa. He also is a member of the Institute of Directors Southern Africa and served as a voluntary non-executive director of the Brightest Young Minds, a leadership development nonprofit company. He looks like, oh, this, the CV sounds like he should be in his 60s and he's so young. Owen, <laughs> welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on the webinar this morning. Um, pleasure. Um, thank you for having me, Darren, and the team. All right, it's going to be great to chat to you and we're going to get straight into the discussion. We're obviously talking about entrepreneurship and we know that you love this every single day. And so I think let's start off by um, why is entrepreneurship so important in our context today? I think we yeah, all sort of know um, the different unemployment rates that this has been coming out of the country, particularly now after COVID. You know, a lot of our people are unemployed um, for different complex reasons, you know, um, internationally and also uh, domestically. 
so you find people come out of tertiary and they are unemployed for uh, those reasons that I just, just mentioned before, but also uh, because they are learning skills that are unemployable. So you've got graduates that are unemployable in the community. And for that reason, um, for, that, for, that, for the reason that we, we cannot in this economy absorb everybody, people should begin to start thinking about uh, building their own businesses. And I think what I want to say before we even carry on with the conversations is entrepreneurship is, is, is a big word, but it's not a big concept. So I think we see the word entrepreneur, we see the word, we hear people talking about entrepreneurs like Mark Zuckerberg and all those big, big guys. And we think it's something really difficult to get into. But the truth is we've all probably have had some entrepreneurial activity from youth and in our lives at some point. So if you have sold something at school, like cookies or, or whatever it is that you did, uh, you probably did, that was an entrepreneurial activity. And that's also entrepreneurship. If you sold a calculator and added a bit of value and you got a bit of profit from it, that was entrepreneurship. So it's nothing complex or big or some weird phenomenon that we think about. The ladies that we see or our mothers that we see in our streets that are vendors are just as much as entrepreneurs as Mark Zuckerberg who built Facebook. I think so many theories and so many um, um, notes about entrepreneurship come from the West. So we talk about Elon Musk, we talk about Mark Zuckerberg, we talk about all those big guys, but we also have entrepreneurs uh, um, here in, in South Africa. And the ladies that sell on the streets, our families, our mothers who run other shops are just as much as entrepreneurs as anybody else. So entrepreneurship is not a big concept. It's not like some, you know, um, a weird life you need to, to have or you have some, to have some special skills. If you are able to identify an opportunity, monetize that opportunity, you are an, an entrepreneur. And it doesn't mean you have to actually have a big office a registered a CIPC or any, anything like that. If you can identify an opportunity and get somebody else to pay you for that uh, opportunity, you are just as much as an entrepreneur as any, anybody else. So that means I was an entrepreneur when I was doing other kids' homework in school and getting them to pay me for it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> because you found a need, they yeah. finished their homework. Absolutely. You sold the need. And as long as they paid you, you were an entrepreneur. Because the basic business equation, the, 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 the biz, the, Basic equation for business is find value, solve it, and somebody pays you. You're a businessman or you're an entrepreneur. If you are not getting someone paying you for anything you're doing, you're not yet a business person. Because if you strip everything else, if you strip it to, to, to its core, it's actually giving somebody value, they pay you for it, and then um, you solve the need that they have. Need, solution, transaction, money at the end of the day. That's what you need to know. So, yeah. So I think I'll stop there for now because I, I, I get excited. I start going. Oh, and well, so, so you mentioned that you mentioned that it almost comes naturally to people. But I think my next question is: What are some key traits or some key skills that are required for entrepreneurs? So I think I think um, uh, there's been a lot of debate in in academia and uh, everywhere else about whether entrepreneurs are born or entrepreneurs um, are nurtured. Um, and I think there's a lot of evidence that are coming out that people are born as entrepreneurs. Uh, maybe some, more, some people are more predisposed to become uh, more entrepreneurs than others, but in effect, you are all just uh, uh, entrepreneurs at the end of the day. But the skills that have been identified as the most important come an entrepreneur are the following. So number one, personal skills. And I think we're talking about self-esteem, confidence, and ideas like communication. So being able to be, yes, to have self-esteem, to have a good view of yourself. Um, you know, I can go deeper into it, but it's actually just being able to, uh, uh, to have a positive view of your, who you are. If you are always thinking yourself as a failure or you can't do stuff, and I think this, that's already a problem. That would be a difficult um, it's a very difficult place to be because it does not encourage you to become an, uh, uh, an entrepreneur if you always have a negative view of who you are as an individual. So just personal skills, and I've just explained self-esteem as one, but there are others like, um, um, there are so many others like confidence and everything like that. 
Uh, also, one of the skills is social competences, being able to, um, um, to interact with different uh, individuals. So social abilities and social competencies are quite, are quite important. When you get into a space, are you able to engage with other people? Are you able to sell? Because key, one of the key things you're going to need to do when you start your business is to sell. People need to know what you have and people need to know what value they, they can get out of you. But if you can't walk in a room and you can't talk to people, then that's already a problem. If you don't even have friends, that's already a problem. Because as an entrepreneur, you're going to need to engage with people so, for people, so, so people can see the value that you're trying to bring to them. Uh, the next one is, called, is just entrepreneurial abilities. So entrepreneurial abilities, abilities talk about things like uh, critical thinking, uh, negotiating, because you've got to be able to negotiate. Uh, so those are uh, an additional skills that you have. And the last two are more quite technical. Uh, for example, just general, general business management. You've got to know how to manage your money. Financial management, that's, that's going to be important. And some people go to school to do that. They manage finances, they uh, marketing. I think uh, that's another uh, business uh, skill you're going to need to do. Uh, human resources, how do you hire people? How do you fire people? That's going to be quite important uh, for you. Um, and then the last uh, competence that you need to build or skill you need to build to be a great entrepreneur is have a technical understanding of something. For example, if you're a coder, that's good enough. If you're a plumber, that's good enough. You can build your business around a technical, a technical, a technical skill. So for with in your example, for example, Darren, you probably were a maths guru. So that knowing that 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 uh, uh, maths literacy that you had, you built a business around it. You found somebody else who needed it. You had the skill, put to it. You offered it to them, and then they paid you. So you gave them value. So just to summarize, there are five key skills you you will need to help you build a, a, a business or become a better entrepreneur. Personal, and I would explain that there's a lot to it, but I think the best way to say is your own view of yourself. That, that is gonna be the first one. You, you've gotta be able to be self-motivated. You've gotta be able to see positive out of yourself uh, before, before anybody else does. Social, your ability to interact with other individuals, uh, your ability to sell to other people, to communicate with other people outside of yourself. Entrepreneurial, which is just your ability to negotiate and your ability to problem solve, your ability to critically look at issues. And then finally, uh, the last two, business, which is general finance management and also marketing, HR, and so many other uh, business uh, te technical skills. And then finally, technical or knowing something uh, that is um, uh, to a specific, specific industry. It can be as fancy as coding. It can be as little as just as baking, art, painting, all those different things, uh, that's quite going to be quite important uh, for you to, to, to have as a so that could help you or leverage uh, to become an entrepreneur. Let's, let's talk a little bit about, so once somebody has an idea or a solution that they now want to pursue from concept to a profitable business, what are yeah. some key processes to follow? And I know we touched briefly on the value proposition and customer segmentation. So can you expand on, on these and why are they so key? Uh, let's let's give Owen just a moment to um, possibly reconnect. Hi, uh, Jared. Sorry about that. Um, I'm not sure what is happening, but I've decided to join with my phone. Um, do you mind if I carry on without my mic on? That's perfect. Go for it. I was just saying, a value proposition is probably the most important because people, uh, if I refer back to a, an earlier comment that I made, so the first thing is you need to identify a need that somebody has then you create a product that will solve that need. And it will only be a business if that person is able to give you back economic value to you in the sense of money to you. That's in its basic form what a business is. And so I'll give an example of Uber. I want to move from point A to point B in safety and in comfort. And so Uber was created to solve that need that I have. And so I'm very happy to pay Uber money to drive me from A to be. I'll give a ex different example. A Rolex watch, it tells the time exactly as any other Casio or whatever, you know, uh, a dodgy watch that you see. But this is a need that it solved in my life. And maybe it's my self-esteem issues. Maybe when I wear a, a Rolex, I feel much better. I feel like I've accomplished and whatever. And so I'm happy to pay 
um, uh, for this product because it solves a need for me, which is a psychological need perhaps. Um, and I think it's the same as this, there's this bar or club that has been going around. Uh, it's quite a famous one, Konka. They are making money. I'm sure the beer there tastes just as much as good as the taverns in Tembisa, right? But at the end of the day, there's some need that they are solving for people and people are happy to pay money there. And that's in effect what business is about. Identify what need people have, create a solution, a value proposition that you give to solve that need. And the people in turn need to give you value back in the sense of economic value or money for it to be called a business. So it has to be transactional. And so, and so, and so um, um, that covers the first bit about value proposition. Find what a need is and make sure you create a product or a service that's sold for that need. And that is what is called a value proposition. So customer segmentation, you, you nailed it at some point when you introduced uh, the, the concept. A product for everyone is a product for no one. You cannot say you're trying to solve solutions for everybody. Yeah. Your best strategy is to identify the um, uh, people in groups and you can split them up by demographics. Women, you can say, you can, demographics means uh, maybe target people because they are women or you can target people because they are men or you can target people because they are youth or you can target people because they are toddlers or infants. But break down the market and find that group that is probably the best for you to target. You can't target everybody at the same time. Or you can break it down by um, psychological behavior. There are some people who spend more on, on, on uh, towards the month end. Uh, maybe you can target them uh, because of that behavior. Um, so there's different ways you can target people or break down customer uh, your customers. But what is being said here is you need to make sure you when you look at the population, let's say people that live in Soweto, they are not a homogeneous group, which means they're not all the same. Yes, we might all live in Soweto, but it does not mean we are all the same. And so if you bring your bunny chow, you can't come and try and sell the same bunny chow to everybody in Soweto. So break down. Maybe there are people who, um, maybe the people there who are, who are um, young adults that are just starting their jobs and they don't have time to cook Maybe those are the, good, the guys you should start targeting with. Or maybe there are um, uh, families or mothers that don't, don't like to cook. Maybe you target them because of that reason. But you need to break down your population and make sure you understand what are the needs of each, of each category. And then finally, the comment around um, uh, revenue streams. Uh, there's different ways of just making money uh, in a business. And I think the examples that you gave sort of uh, really touched, touched um, uh, the different ways that are there. You can sell an asset. You can hire. Um, you can you can lease out equipment. You can um, get advertising fees. They're just different ways of collecting revenues from a product that you might have. But I think that's a much more um, a, a discussion for 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 a later time. But what you need to do is to nail down what your value proposition is and who the customers are. And if you have those two uh, nailed down, then everything else falls in place. Um, but yeah, I think I'm gonna. Kind of stop from there for now. I'm not sure. Is there any other question? I've got a couple more questions for you since I'm going to try and combine the next two um, in one question. And I think it also speaks to so many of the comments that are coming through in the chat. And so, what are the realities for entrepreneurs? What does it really take to make a success? And then the second part of the question is what tips can you give to students today who are thinking about going into entrepreneurship? Okay, great. I think I will kind of answer those same, the same questions. It is hard. That's tip number one. It's, it's not going to be easy. In research, there's actually a statement that says uh, most businesses will fail within the first five years. So if you've moved past year number five, that's actually good because it means you've really learned. So anything that you're going to start, be rest assured, uh, people that are listening, it will probably fail before it gets uh, to year number five. That, that's, that's quite a reality. And it's there and it's studied here, not just in South Africa, it's studied in the US, studied anywhere else. You are likely going to fail. That's, that's the same thing that I'm gonna tell you. But that's also good because failure is experience. Unfortunately, what separates entrepreneurs who are in the US, for example, and, and in Africa generally, is that we have a, we have a 
uh, negative culture or negative, negative perception about failure. In the US, you actually get more funding from investors if you can demonstrate that you failed many more times before. Here, when someone's business fails, they, be, they trend on, on, on Twitter and people you know, throw stones or people or whatever. But actually, failing is quite important when you're trying to start a business because each failure that you have builds your understanding of what needs to happen. So the first thing that needs to happen here as a tip uh, to you guys is change your perception or your relationship with failure. Be happy when you fail in a business because you've learned something and you pick yourself later on. Yes, it's some failures are painful, that is true, but it's actually uh, better when you fail and you understand because when you fail for the 10th time or the fifth time or the sixth time, it's actually going to be uh, you, you build your understanding, your capabilities of running a business. And the third time you fail, you probably make it. The fourth time you try, you probably make it a success. So failure in an entrepreneurial uh, uh, context is not a bad thing. And actually, we, should, we should be celebrating people that are trying things. There's no point in laughing at those that are trying when you are sitting at the back of your, of your, of your, of your house and not trying anything else for yourself. I think that's the last tip I can give. Nice one. So I think with that means um, Kubongiwe in the chat who says my self-esteem has been down for long because I've had two failed businesses so far and I hope that the webinar will improve me, um, will help me to improve. So well done to you, um, Kubongiwe. Two failed businesses, that means you are steps ahead of those who haven't started yet. My yeah. final question to you, Owen, is so many in the, uh, on the webinar today are still studying. What can they be doing now if they aim to be entrepreneurs instead of seeking employment when they finish their studies? And what is the best way that they can prepare themselves for entrepreneurship after their studies? Great. And if people are thinking about studying entrepreneurship now, that's actually great. Start something, even if you're in school. Sell pens to people in school. Or like what you just what like, like what you referred to, Darren, help someone with homework and charge them. If you want to see whether or not you're going to be good at entrepreneurship. The best way to do it is to some, do something. Come up with an idea and test it out. Go in the market and see if the market will respond. And the biggest validation of your idea if they, is if there's somebody who's willing to give you uh, um, money or an exchange of uh, a solution that you're bringing on the table. That's the biggest validation. So start something. Even while, better yet while you're school or while you're in a job. That's probably the best because there's safety, there is um, some comfort. Uh, and you, you don't have to rush. You don't have to do it every day. If you do it within three months, you try and sell one pen to test out to, well, not one pen, but you try to sell something within three months, that's also just good enough. So you don't have to put, just put pressure on yourself to build something that is Facebook big when you are still at the beginning. But what I'm saying is start something. So I want to come back to, to just the comment made by the, the lady who, sell, who said she started something and, it, and it's failed. Um, I would like to recommend that you watch or you Google something called, and, I, and I'm sorry for the word I'm gonna use, but I think it's actually there. It's called uh, Nights. So it's a movement that was built in Canada, but is now spread across the world. I think they tried to do it here in South Africa a bit. But that movement, uh, so you could, if you would go on YouTube, uh, just Google that, you find entrepreneurs that have failed in endeavors that they've tried. And they go up and speak about where they failed and what mistakes they made. I've watched it quite a couple of times when I had failed and it's been extremely encouraging because you get to see that failure is not a bad thing when you're an entrepreneur. And I think we have a tendency in Africa to only celebrate successes, but also there's learning when it comes to um, failings. And I'll recommend to you to, to look at it. So it's www.fupnights. Um, um, and I think you'd find it very encouraging. Thanks. Owen, thank you so much. We're going to get you back towards the end if we've got time for Q&A, but start thinking about a tip for the week. But I think you've really just, you've really enlightened us so much in the few minutes that we've had a chat with you. Thank you so much. We're going to catch up with you shortly. Next up, let me introduce our next guest who we had. I think it was webinar one where we spoke about budgeting and this guy blew us all out the water when he spoke about how he's able to save 90% of his income. Musa Maluleka is a 21-year-old postgraduate student and entrepreneur 
founder of Disky, a soccer boot brand that makes soccer boots that are specifically designed and crafted to play on the gravel soccer pitches we have in Africa. Musa also runs a segment of the business that makes personalized shin pads that he sells to professional soccer players with over 100 players in the PSL playing for the likes of Mama Lodi Sundowns and Orlando Pirates playing with these shin pads. He's the recipient of the Mail and Guardian Top 200 Young South Africa um, 2020. He's the Global Student Entrepreneurship Award South Africa winner for 2020 and the Entrepreneurship Development in Higher Education Best General Existing Business winner for 2019. What an impressive CV. Musa, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me, Darren. Thank you again for just taking time out and literally running out of your seminar to be on the webinar today. And so let's get straight into it. Let's talk about what motivated you to get into entrepreneurship. So I think for me personally, it started out as an inspiration that I got from primary, just learning about the word entrepreneur, what an entrepreneur is. So it kind of fascinated me that it's like one day I want to be this. And then I think in high school, just starting to sell bookmarks to my schoolmates. That's when the journey actually started. But unfortunately enough, I was able to become part of a scholarship called Allen Gray Obis Foundation that kind of nurtured the entrepreneur in me and kind of motivated me to actually start pursuing a bigger purpose in terms of entrepreneurship. Let's talk about, so your main value proposition focuses on a soccer boot that is suitable for township, for the township market. What else was a key in your value proposition? So personally for me, I think I started this with the purpose. So the purpose for me was because I started playing soccer from a young age and I saw that many of my mates would stop playing soccer due to not having soccer boots and would end up smoking drugs and stuff. So I was like, how do I solve this problem? But then I had to look at it holistically because if I wasn't only trying to solve the value proposition of making soccer boots that are durable to play on gravel, but then also affordability. Because you go to rural areas and you find that even when you're selling a soccer boot for 500, a young kid who's in a rural area can't afford the soccer boot. So that's kind of the element in terms of the value proposition that I've been looking at in terms of the value proposition of making sure the boots are durable enough, but also affordable for young kids also in the rural areas and townships. Mm. Musa, what are some of the various, some of your various revenue streams, if you have more than one, and how has this helped the business? So actually when I started, I started out just like with soccer boots, started out making soccer boots for gravel soccer pitches. And then for me, I started thinking of how can I market this business? Because like you're fighting with big brands like Nike, Puma and Adidas who have huge marketing budgets. And I realized that the key props, like the key value proposition that they have in terms of their marketing is professional soccer players. So I started researching on how can I work with professional soccer players. So I looked into every single contract that they have with the big brands, the endorsement contracts. Then I realized it doesn't include shin pads. And one problem I identified that there were no personalized shin pads where you can put your picture on it or a message that was sold in South Africa. So I was like, let me start selling personalization pets to professional soccer players and see if it works. Then I started it two years ago and now I have over 100 PSL players who are playing with the shin pets. So that's kind of the other revenue stream that I've gained outside of selling the soccer boots. But now actually I'm starting to look into gaining a revenue stream from corporate companies because my purpose and my key value proposition personally for me is to actually help kids in the rural areas who are not able to afford soccer boots. So that's a revenue stream that I'm currently working on that's still on the ground. You're so innovative. <laughs> Tell us about your various customer segments. I know you've mentioned you've got the soccer players, you now you're targeting corporates. Are there any others? Yeah, so for me, it's like simple as that. It's plain simple. It's amateur soccer players, professional soccer players. And now I'm targeting the corporates and still working on the value proposition. And then that obviously takes time. Yeah. Musa, so what are some of the challenges um, and milestones that you've experienced in running your business? So for me personally, the challenge, the key challenge that I faced was I started this business when I was 19 years old. And like it was starting this business with a vision that I want to have a soccer boot brand for the whole of Africa. So the first thing that you think about is funding. So I didn't have the money to actually start it. So I used my savings that I'd saved up since primary. So that was the key challenge that I faced, funding. And then after gaining funding from Alan Grobe's foundation, now you look into distribution. So when you start something like 
you just think of this idea, but then when you even thought about the distribution in terms of how to distribute the product as an entrepreneur, you actually struggle in the beginning. So that's the key challenge that I faced currently. And that's the key challenge that I'm also trying to solve at this point going forward into the future. And I think key milestones that I've like achieved, it's actually launching, launching itself because it takes courage to start something at the age of 19 and you launch it to every, like you launch it, it's not something that you launch into your family or your school. Like you launch it to your country as a whole. So it takes a lot of courage. For, so for me, that was the first actual milestone that I achieved. And then the second milestone is actually achieving, gaining funding. Because in the South African context, it's difficult to gain funding when you have improved the proof of concept. So actually gaining funding to prove the proof of concept and actually selling to the first customer because it's difficult to sell like a new product whilst they're a kid from a township and you're selling it to someone from a township because the way they view it, they don't view it as a Nike. So that first customer that I got was a key milestone for me. Wow, I love it. Um, did you receive training prior to starting your business or how did you acquire the skills that you have now to run your business? So I think for me, it speaks again to what I talked about, about courage. So I'm very, very courageous. So I can just get into something even if I don't know it. So for, for me personally, as I told you, I was still 19 years and I was doing my second year in varsity. I just had a basic accounting knowledge, but then I didn't have the knowledge of soccer boots, how to make soccer boots, the training, the part of like how to grow this business. So I just threw myself into a deep end and then I grew it every single month. So for me, I live by a philosophy that every single day just get better. So if I want to make a soccer boot brand, I start, how do I get the design? The next day, I, then you just grow. Because sometimes you find skills, but you can't apply them practically. So for me, it's if you want to do something, as long as you are able to think about it, just throw yourself into a deep end and start learning while doing the journey, especially because now I'm talking to us young people, you don't have so much responsibilities. So you have that leverage to kind of start learning practically. Mm. Nice one. Um, you remind me of a quote by, I think it's Richard Branson, who says, when you see an opportunity, if somebody gives you an opportunity, just say yes, and you'll figure out how to do it later. <laughs> yeah. Musa, my last question to you is, so tell us a little bit about where you see your business in the next five years. So for me personally, I think for me, this is a purpose-driven business for me. And it's like something that I'm running personally. So for me, I just want to see this business, if there would be success. For me, success would be seeing thousands of kids in South Africa who wouldn't actually have been able to afford a soccer boot, having soccer boots and playing with them on gravel. There would be actually a success. And that's where I see the business in the next five years. And that's something that I actually work towards every single day to get there and make sure that after five years, I get there. Nice one. Um, one question that came in the chat for you was, did you make the soccer boots yourself or did you collaborate with other people? So as, as I told you, when I started, I didn't know anything about making soccer boots. So I had to learn from the start. So I had to find someone who can design soccer boots. And then I had to start looking into where can I find a manufacturer who makes soccer boots. Then I found the samples and then I started testing them out. So I, find, I have a manufacturer who manufactures them, but then the designing part, and the actually it's like choosing the material, the testing part of in doing them myself. Great. Manda, I hope that answers your question. Musa, thank you so much. We're going to get you back for a tip of the week shortly. Um, I think every time we speak to you, it's just so, so inspiring. I can see even in the chat, people are so impressed by just what you've achieved and your journey so far. So thank you so much for sharing with us and think about your tip for the week coming up shortly. Owen, if you could answer this question, um, what um, would we consider people who start or register and run an NPO as entrepreneurs, considering that they do solve an unmet need, or is it because they don't necessarily generate revenue as their primary objective that they would not be entrepreneurs? I think that's quite a good question. That's from Lebo Han. Okay, um, that's great. So I think, I think for the question around um, MPOs, if it's a pure NPO, um, I, I wouldn't want to describe them as, as a pure entrepreneur, but, but maybe let me, let me move over to, to what, we, what we are seeing now in, in research and also in, in practice and on the ground. There's now a concept called social entrepreneurship, which is actually 
um, a combination of, I guess, people that see a social need and then find a solution for that social need. And uh, in some cases, will make um, uh, revenue from that social need, but that for, from that solution, but that revenue is plowed back into um, into uh, communities um, or into into the into the cause that you're fighting for. Um, um, and so, so that's kind of that's a bit slightly a step up. So, if if you want to put it on a scale, one end of the scale, you've got pure NPOs and pure NPOs. Um, go around, I guess, asking for grants and funding from individuals. So I would not describe those as entrepreneurs. They may be good managers. They're very good managers of the money that they find, but they're not necessarily entrepreneurs. But a step up is then a social entrepreneur who is, I guess, a bit of a mix between uh, an opportunity-driven individual, but who's also very socially inclined that wants to um, solve a societal issue that is there, but they come up with a solution and they actually um, are paid for it. And then on the last end of the scale, a pure, the pure uh, capitalist entrepreneur, somebody who's just there for the money. And that's good enough as well. So there's nothing wrong if you really want to be in business because you just only really make money. That's also just as, just as good. So you got NPOs, social entrepreneurs in the middle and um, uh, pure capitalist uh, entrepreneurs at the end. Um, and all of those, um, uh, and there's no one that's better than the other. If you feel just being an NPO and you just want to be a manager of funds, uh, that's also a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. And the social entrepreneur is slightly a mix of uh, somebody who is inclined to solve social issues, but also have an entrepreneurial drive to it. Um, and also a pure capitalist on the end who's an entrepreneur. Um, yeah, it, I think it just goes with which one would you want to be? And uh, they're all just as good as uh, any, any of the others. Great one. Owen, your final tip for the week as you say goodbye to you. I think I think the the my tip for the week is this maybe maybe actually actually two. Uh, so number number the, number one, anyone can be an entrepreneur. It's not a special anointing that you need to have to be an entrepreneur. It's not there's there's nothing special about it. Um, if you are able to find a a um, need that you actually solve for. Uh, and you get money from it. It could be one client. It can be a hundred client. There's not. There's actually uh, no difference. You are an entrepreneur just as much as any 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 other big person. So anyone can be an entrepreneur, uh, to be honest. And if you are thinking about it, I'll say go ahead and start something. That's Owen Muzambi. Thank you so much, Owen. I think you've given us a wealth of information. And I think especially because you live this every day, it's been such a, such a pleasure talking to you and having you on the webinar today. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Darren. And thank, thanks to everybody and all the best with your entrepreneurial journeys. Awesome stuff. Musa, your final tip for the week. So my final tip for the week is be passionately optimistic about yourself and your ideas and just get into it. And I'm saying it from like a fellow young person because I'm not better than you. I'm also a fellow young person to you. So that's my advice and something that I apply with my own life. Be passionately optimistic about yourself and your ideas and just start. Doesn't matter how many people reject you, just start and keep going on and be passionately optimistic about yourself and your ideas. Beautiful. Musa, thank you once more. Um, as always, so inspiring and such a pleasure talking to you. Guys, I think there you have it. The clear message today is, um, and I think you can see, um, Owen really set the context so nicely saying that at this point, especially with the, with the position we find ourselves in in our country, where there is just not enough jobs to absorb everybody, it's so, so important that we start approaching things with an entrepreneurial mindset, look for opportunities to create income streams for ourselves. And so that's what we're going to be talking about next week. We're going to be talking about hustling and side hustles. All right, so the activities for the week, remember to log on to the L Plus Earn Moodle platform, register, download resources, participate in the forums and quizzes, and you can stand a chance to win some weekly prizes. www.lplusearn.co.za, that's for the Moodle platform. Then um, there are the weekly prizes of 300 Rand shopping vouchers for the most interactive, as well as the first person to complete the weekly survey, all right? And that, um, then also visit the website, www.lplusearn.org. And that brings us to the end of today's session. I want to see some comments in the chat quickly. 
because I know that the chat was absolutely lit today. And let's continue the discussion on the Moodle platform. But so many of you, um, let us know what you thought of today's webinar, guys. And that would be, it would be great to know. But from my side, it's been an absolute pleasure. I can't believe we are seven weeks down and it still feels like we are just getting started. Next week, we are talking about side hustling, okay? Well, we're gonna talk about how do you um, get into hustling? How do you start a side hustle? And so you are gonna be blown away by just the amount of opportunities that are available for you to start creating additional income streams. And so have a great week. Thank you so much one more time for joining us. Thank you for being here on time. Thank you for engaging with us. Thank you for engaging in the webinar. Thank you to Owen for sharing so, um, so openly and so selflessly. Thank you to Musa for giving us insight into your life and your journey. It's been an absolute pleasure. Have a great week, guys. This has been the Assisa Foundation L Plus Earn Financial Literacy Program for young adults. Hashtag secure the bag. Have a great week. I will see you next week as we end off with a bang. My name is Darren August, and it's been an absolute pleasure being your host on today's webinar. Bye-bye.